Chapter 10. The Nineteenth-Century Monarchy, 1826-1910 On John VI's death on the 10th of March, 1826, his son, Peter, Emperor of Brazil, and now Peter IV of Portugal, issued the Constitutional Charter in order to try to lessen the tension between liberals and absolutists. He also abdicated in favour of his daughter Maria, who was then seven, with the condition that she marry her uncle Miguel. She became Maria II. Peter abdicated because he was aware that neither the Portuguese nor the Brazilians wanted a united kingdom. Peter's brother Miguel returned from exile in Vienna as regent and fiancé of his niece Maria, he argued that Peter had forfeited his claim to the Portuguese throne by declaring Brazilian independence. Isabel Maria, John's unmarried daughter, was regent from 1826 until 1828, when a civil war began. Miguel replaced Maria II, whom he never married, was proclaimed king by the Cortes, and abolished the 1826 constitution. This led to the outbreak of fighting, with the garrison in Oporto declaring its loyalty to Peter IV, his daughter Maria, and the Constitutional Charter. The rebellion, the opening stage in the liberal wars between the liberals and the absolutist Miguelist faction, spread, but was brutally suppressed by Miguel, who was backed by the church and the landowners, both of whom were concerned by liberalism. Many liberals fled abroad to Spain or Britain, Others were arrested. Isabel Maria had retired from politics and returned to piety. In 1831, Peter abdicated in Brazil in favour of his son and sailed for Europe to challenge Miguel. This took much effort and many years, and the accompanying conflict and disruption inflicted much economic damage, damage that plays a role in helping explain the low economic growth rate of the period. Peter first established a government in liberal run Tercera in the Azores. The following July, Peter landed near Oporto, which he captured, only to be besieged there. On the 5th of July 1833, however, Miguel's fleet was beaten by the smaller liberal navy under Sir Charles Napier off Cape St Vincent, after landing an expedition under a leading liberal, the Duke of Tercera, in the Algarve. The naval battle was settled in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. From the Algarve, Tercera marched north through the Alentejo, defeating the Miguelists on the 23rd of July at Almada or Cova da Piedad, after which the Liberals occupied Lisbon. Miguelist attempts to storm Oporto and Lisbon were repulsed with heavy losses. Maria was proclaimed Queen anew in 1833 and Peter made regent, he confiscated the property of Miguel's supporters and suppressed the monasteries. In 1834, Tercera and the Duke of Saldana defeated the Miguelists at El Muster, the 18th of February, and Aceceira, the 16th of May. The last, fought near Tomar, was decisive, with the Miguelists suffering heavy casualties. Eight days later, faced by disaffection from his officers, Miguel surrendered at Évora. By the subsequent concession of Evremont on the 26th of May, he surrendered his claim to the throne and was banished. Peter died soon after, on the 24th of September, 1834, his legacy including an equestrian statue in Libertad Square in Oporto. Both sides had been very short of funds, and compared to the campaigning in Portugal during the Peninsular War, this conflict was under-resourced, the manpower, materiel and funds that the British and French had been able to provide during the Peninsular War were all lacking. Nevertheless, that did not mean that military skill was absent, as Saldana showed in 1834. The Civil War was destructive, including deliberate devastation, as with the burning of the town of Albufeira by Miguel's supporters in 1833. The Civil War was the most destructive conflict in post-Napoleonic Portuguese history, although comparisons with the colonial wars of the 1960s and early 1970s are difficult. Civil War did not help Portugal's overseas position either. It was no longer able to maintain a successful imperial impetus. 
In Mozambique, the Zulu, an expansionist people, sacked Lourenço Marques in 1833. In Angola, the Portuguese moved into the Central Plateau in the mid-1830s and established a fort at São Salvador in the mid-1850s, but it was abandoned in 1866. Although Miguel, once in exile, denounced the concession, the Miguelists did not have the persistence in Spain of the Carlists, another counter-revolutionary movement that also drew on peasant anger against government. However, instability continued. In September 1836, the radicals seized power in Portugal, the same year in which there was a successful liberal revolution in Spain. In both countries, the politicisation of the army was a key factor. It was the principal body that could stage and or resist coups or rebellions, a situation that looked towards its crucial role in Portugal and Spain in the 20th century. Saldana benefited from his success in 1834 in serving as President of the Council in 1835. In 1836, however, the situation went out of control, with a revolt by officers in August followed by a revolution in September and the reinstating of the 1822 constitution by the Setembristes. Maria fled to Belém and sought to sponsor a counter-revolution, but in the face of threats from the Setembristes, she failed. In turn, in 1837, in the revolt of the marshals, Saldana and Tercera, with British backing, tried and failed to overthrow the new government. The Setembristas then organised a militant national guard that dominated Lisbon, only to be suppressed by troops in March 1838. Fresh insurrections followed in 1842 and 1844. Saldana became president of the council in 1846 to 1849, 1851 to 1856 and 1870, the last a military dictatorship. A revolutionary insurrection in the Minho in the spring of 1846, which in October became a civil war known as the Patulea, or Little Civil War, was crushed by royalist troops that December in the Battle of Torchvedrash. This instability was scarcely unique in Europe, but it helped explain the problems facing economic growth. The inexperienced Maria II ruled 1826 to 1828 and 1834 to 1853, had two husbands. Her first husband, Auguste, Duke of Lechtenberg, died two months after the marriage, but in 1836 she married Prince Ferdinand of saxe coburg gotha a marriage that lasted. The cousin of the Prince Albert, who married Queen Victoria of Britain, he was a keen patron of the arts and built an extravagant summer palace at Piena, near Sintra. Maria sought to improve educational provision and to tackle cholera. The Teatro Nacional de Dona Maria II, built in Lisbon in the 1840s, is a lasting monument to the reign. Maria's government was opposed by left-wing liberals seeking to curb royal authority on the lines of the Constitution of 1822. Her supporters were the Cartistas, upholding the Constitutional Charter of 1826 granted by her father, Peter IV. There were calls for modernization and socio-economic improvement, notably from Muzini de Silveira. Maria died, aged only 34, in 1853. Obesity and difficult pregnancies were the causes of this early death. Maria's son, Peter V, ruled 1853 to 1861, who started reigning at the age of 18 in 1855 after a two-year regency period under his father, Don Fernando, pursued policies of modernization, notably in infrastructure and public health. Railways and roads were constructed in a period that lasted into the next reign and was called the Regeneration. Peter pleased Victoria when he visited her in Britain, because although he went to mass, he criticised the ignorance and immorality of Portuguese society and praised his host country. However, with two of his brothers, Peter fell victim to an epidemic, and as a result of a childless marriage, was succeeded by his brother Luis Primero, ruled 1861 to 1889. Luis's legacy included the Palace of Ajuda in Belém, an expensive neoclassical work, 
and he was also responsible for the development of Cascais as a summer resort. As with Italy and Spain, government alternated between two groupings, one of which was more conservative and less liberal than the others. In Portugal, this meant the Regeneradores and the Progressistas, in a pattern of frequent and destabilizing changes known as the Rotativismo. The king favoured the former, backing their dominance of the 1880s. By British standards, the Conservative Party, Regeneradores, was not illiberal, and its liberal rival not particularly popular. The illiberals were only the remaining Miguelists. Luis's son, Charles I, ruled 1889 to 1908, faced more difficult domestic circumstances, with an increase in both republicanism and radicalism, which was part of a European pattern. In 1900, Charles responded to republican electoral success in Oporto by quashing the result, which led to the election of new republicans, and ended the session of the Cortes in order to quieten republicanism there. The political system no longer appeared to be delivering acceptable results, or certainly those that offered a consensus. The king responded in May 1907 by imposing a dictatorial-style government under João Franco, who got Charles to dismiss Parliament when he lost his majority without an immediate call for elections. Charles granted that, conceding to Franco what he had denied a year earlier to Ernesto Hinz Ribeiro, the leader of the Regenerator Party, who had been Prime Minister in 1893 to 1897, 1900 to 1904 and 1906. The government was called by then an administrative dictatorship. Franco, who had come to power in May 1906 with the support of the king, sought a government of popularity and order, one in which royalism was to be defended in a strong fashion, while the traditional elites were bypassed in a search for popular backing. Initially successful, this policy ran adrift of the constitutional limitations on government. In response, Franco became increasingly authoritarian, not least with a vigorous censorship of the press. However, this stance compromised the popularity of both government and monarchy. Charles was assassinated by two anarchists in the Tirero do Passo in central Lisbon on the 1st of February 1908, his wounded eldest son, Luis Felipe, was also killed after shooting back from the royal carriage. The money spent by the kings on palaces, for example the Neo-Manueline one at Busaco, built on the site of a Carmelite monastery, commissioned as a hunting lodge by Charles in 1888 and finished in 1907, was a marked contrast to the poverty of most of their subjects. The Republicans attacked royal expenditure, which was a key political issue, and notably so, as in 1907, when Franco increased the government grant to the crown and paid off the crown's debts. Charles's younger son, who became Manuel II in 1908, only ruled until 1910. Charles's murder was followed by the dismissal on the 4th of February of Franco, the murderer's initial target, and he went into exile. Manuel, however, did not benefit from any surge in popularity, although he tried to win support by ending press censorship and releasing those imprisoned under Franco for political beliefs. The recent increase in the grant to the crown was reversed, and some palaces became national monuments, including Sintra, Ajuda and Quilus. Nevertheless, governmental stability could not be gained, in part because the Republicans wanted the overthrow of the monarchy. In Manuel's brief reign alone, there were six ministries. In 1910, in the context of growing ministerial instability and of a steadily more militant Republican Party, he was overthrown in a Republican revolution that broke out on the 3rd of October. Troops set up barricades in Lisbon, and the royal palace was shelled by two warships. This was a military coup backed by the Carboneria, a secret republican organisation. There was some opposition from within the army, which led to fighting, and only limited public support for the revolution, but republicanism had backing in the middle class, and had triumphed in the municipal elections in Lisbon in 1908. 
as in Brazil in 1889, the military played the key role in 1910. On the 5th of October 1910, faced by the Republican takeover in Lisbon, Manuel sailed from Ericeira, not to Oporto to call for support, as he may have sought, but instead for exile in Britain. There he lived in Fulwell Park, Twickenham, until he died in 1932. Manuel's bedroom can be seen in the Pena Palace in the Serra de Sintra. Three years earlier, Franco had died, but back in Portugal. Empire With the loss of Brazil, Portugal had lost an empire but failed to gain a role. Portugal, meanwhile, had seen imperial expansion, although not on the scale of Britain, France, the Netherlands or Germany. Control over Angola and Mozambique increased in the 1890s, in part because there was no disaster to match that which faced Italy in Ethiopian hands at Adwa in 1896, and these successes left the memorabilia preserved in military museums, such as those in Braganza and Lisbon. The ability to win local support was important to Portuguese success. To a degree, this ability was a product of local rivalries. Thus, in defeating the Kingdom of Gaza in Mozambique in 1895, the squares of Portuguese infantry used their Kropatschek magazine rifles to defeat Gaza charges, but the Portuguese also benefited from rebellions against the kingdom by its subject people. In the Zambezi Valley, the Portuguese took over the strongholds of warlords they defeated, and in some cases occupied them with garrisons. The fortified post, sometimes called a presidio, was the nucleus for a rudimentary administration. For the most part, the soldiers who garrisoned them were sipaish, African soldiers fighting for Portugal. New Portuguese forts in the colonies were square in shape, with corner turrets, and sometimes with strengthened bastions for mounting artillery. North of the River Congo, Portugal established Cabinda as a protectorate in 1885, although the great powers meeting in the Conference of Berlin that year, by extending the Congo Free State's boundary to the sea, ensured that Angola and Cabinda were not territorially joined. Portugal's position there was consolidated by 1901. There was also expansion into the interior from Portuguese Guinea, but as with the British colony of Gambia, this was small-scale, due to a much greater and all-encompassing expansion of the French in the region. So also to the south of Lorenzo Marques in Mozambique, with small successive advances in 1875 and 1891, but British expansion northwards into Zululand from Natal was extensive and blocked Portuguese opportunities. Expansion in Africa, notably the Contra Costa plan to link Angola and Mozambique through the establishment of intervening colonies, was seen particularly by the Lisbon Geographical Society, founded in 1875, as a way of reviving Portugal's strength and fulfilling its imperial destiny, replacing long-lost Brazil. This was similar to Britain making extensive Indian gains soon after the loss, in 1783, of the 13 colonies of what became the United States. The coast-to-coast -coast Portuguese advance in Africa appeared viable for most of the 19th century. In 1880, the lands in between Angola and Mozambique were occupied by native territories, principally Luanda, the Kololo Empire and the Matabili Empire. This remained the case in the mid-1880s. There were now German colonies in East Africa, now Tanzania, and Southwest Africa, Namibia. But the boundary lines recognised for them in 1886, although favourable to Germany and for the free trade zone of the Congo Free State established by the Berlin Act of 1885 and run by Leopold II of Belgium, still left plenty of room for a coast-to-coast -coast Portuguese empire. However, the Berlin Conference also emphasised the need for establishing sufficient authority as the basis for advancing territorial claims. This provision led to Portuguese activity from 1884, including the establishment that year of the town of Beira, 
and in 1889 the attempt to stake claims in modern Zimbabwe and Malawi. Portuguese hopes were thwarted by northward British expansion into what became southern Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, northern Rhodesia, Zambia and Nyasaland, Malawi. In Britain, missionary supporters backing the Scottish missions in the Shire Highlands, Malawi, played a key role, as did supporters of Cecil Rhodes's British South Africa Company. A British ultimatum in 1890 related to expansion from Mozambique, not Angola, and demanded the withdrawal of the Portuguese troops that had moved forward from Mozambique in 1888 to 1889, this ultimatum resulted in treaties in 1891 and 1899 that stabilised Portugal's colonial boundaries, forcing Portugal to abandon its claims, based on historical discovery and recent exploration, as laid out in the rose-coloured map of 1886, an annex to a supposedly secret Portuguese-German convention signed in 1886, and leaving the lands in between open to British expansion. Portugal was obliged to accept British control of what became the Rhodesias and the British protectorate of what became Botswana. In 1905, the border between Angola and northern Rhodesia was settled. Moreover, the Boer republics of the Orange Free State and the Transvaal were left more clearly in the British sphere of interest, and the Boer War of 1899 to 1902 established British control in both. Under pressure, the ultimatum, which was seen as a national humiliation for Portugal, was accepted by Charles I and helped make the government and the king unpopular. Indeed, it led to anti-British rioting in Oporto in 1890, including the storming of the consul's house and an attempted republican coup there in 1891, the Portuguese ministry fell in 1890 as a result of the terms of a draft treaty. Charles continued to be closely associated with Britain, which he visited anew in 1895, 1901, 1902 and 1904. He had received the Order of the Garter in 1891. However, the 1890 ultimatum began the instability of Portugal's long 20th century, and in particular a series of dramatic political breaks. An idea of national failure gathered pace. With foreign debt of over £140 million in 1890, a serious balance of payments problem and falling gold reserves, Portugal, which declared a partial repudiation of its foreign debt in 1892, was in no state to resist. Indeed, in 1898, the Portuguese financial crisis resulted in a secret Anglo-German treaty allocating Angola and Mozambique in the event of Portugal wishing to sell them. France was also interested in Angola. There was no such sale, but instead another fiscal crisis in 1902. Separately, in 1904, Portugal agreed with the Dutch to divide the island of Timor, this was followed in 1912 by the Portuguese suppression of the independent Timorese nobles. However, whereas the Dutch had rapidly taken over what eventually became Indonesia, there was no Portuguese expansion in the region other than in what became East Timor. 19th Century Changes The 19th century left impressive signs and symbols of change in metropolitan Portugal, in Oporto, more particularly, there is a series of bridges across the Douro. The first, a pontoon bridge, built in 1806, had collapsed under refugees fleeing French forces in 1809. From the 1840s on, a number of bridges survive in Oporto, most dramatically the 1877 Maria Pia Bridge, a wrought iron structure that was then the longest single arch span in the world. Support from British merchants and a design by Gustav Eiffel were the key elements. Although no longer used, the bridge remains dramatic. It was followed by the double-deck Dom Luis Primero Bridge, designed by Theophil Zeyrig, which, when opened in 1886, had the longest span of its type in the world. Metro trams now cross the bridge. 
Bridges and other works such as the Gloria 1885 and Santa Justa 1902 elevators in Lisbon were dramatic signs of modernity. So also was the endorsement of aspects of the liberal agenda. In 1842, an Anglo-Portuguese treaty abolished the slave trade. However, it proved difficult to stamp out the trade, which provided the prime source of Brazil's slaves, not least because Portuguese officials in Angola colluded with it. In 1861, Charles Buxton MP complained to the British Prime Minister, Viscount Palmerston, claiming that there was now scarcely any slave trade except from Portugal's African colonies. Buxton suggested offering Portugal the assistance of two or three British consuls to watch the conduct of the officials, the sort of infringement of sovereignty that other powers found unacceptable. Portugal followed up by abolishing slavery in 1861. There continued, however, to be multiple overlaps between servitude and the Portuguese world, trying to make Angola a smaller version of Brazil, producing sugar and coffee for export, the Portuguese colonial government relied illegally on surreptitious slaving. But the policy failed. The Portuguese also sought to use indentured servants to grow cocoa on Saint Tomé. The nationalisation of the lands of the monasteries in Portugal in 1834 was another major sign of modernity. This was a measure passed by the Minister of Justice, Joaquim Antonio d'Aguiar, a liberal. He went on to be Prime Minister in 1841-42, to 42, 1860 and 1865-1868, and was referred to as the Killer of Friars because of his action against the monasteries. As in England in the 16th century, monastic buildings and estates became a source of profit for others, most of the land was purchased by existing landowners and by speculators. The extensive urban properties were used for the state, with the parliament, the Palacio de São Biento, housed in a former convent, for the army, for example the Santa Clara convent in Coimbra, by the police and other state bodies. The measure was anti-clerical and directed at those associated with Miguel, rather than leading to social reform. This change to institutions that had been active for centuries was registered in the details of life across the country. Local patterns of social welfare were greatly affected. The measure did not increase popular support for the government or the political system. Portugal abolished the death penalty in 1867 for all crimes except in the military and for all crimes in 1911, this was far in advance of most states, although Venezuela had done so in 1863. Victor Hugo praised such a humanitarian country. The last execution in Portugal took place in 1846. The death penalty was subsequently reintroduced for military crimes in 1916, with one execution accordingly in 1917 in France during the war, and was abolished anew in 1976. A very different form of change was offered by the development of a railway system from 1856. That year, the first railway line, that from Lisbon to Garigado, was opened. A network spread, albeit far more slowly than in France or Britain. Lisbon was linked into the European system via the Portuguese rail junction of Entroncamiento and via Badajoz in Spain, in 1887, a line along the Douro that had begun in 1875 was completed, and also that year the Sud Express first ran from Paris to Lisbon via Madrid. In 1888, the service was run twice weekly from London, becoming a daily from 1907. Townscapes were changed as stations were built and lines driven through. The stations were major works, Finished in 1887, Rosario's station in Lisbon was built in a neo-Manueline style with Moorish-style horseshoe arches. The original Oporto railway station was followed in 1903 by the more central Sao Biento train station, finished in 1916 on the site of a monastery. It was enhanced in 1930 by about 20,000 tiles that show the history of transport as well as historic battle scenes.
including Henry the Navigator's conquest of Ceuta in 1415 and is a tourist site today. The development of a train system increased the need for coal, but Portugal had no production of coal or iron, which increased its dependence on Britain. Charles Meyer's impressive 1844 map of Lisbon showed it before the impact of the railway. The city was spreading along the coast and inland, but it remained focused on Baixa and the hills on either side. The railway led to major changes. So also did urban development schemes that drew on greater prosperity and the need to support a growing city. The Avenida de Liberdad, created in the 1880s, was a central axis that shaped a northward spread of the city. In turn, that was taken onwards by the Rotunda, with its central statue of Pombal, and then by the Parc Eduardo du Settimo. The king paid a state visit. Tourists included Alfred Lord Tennyson, who went from Lisbon to Sintra, which he surprisingly described as rather cockney. There was new money, for example, in the Lapa area of Lisbon. So also with a Porto. The Porto's stock exchange, built from 1842 to 1910 on the site of the Monastery of St. Francis, shows the wealth of the period. The introduction in the Porto of 1895 of the first electric trams in Iberia was a sign of innovation. Indeed, the Tram Museum in Oporto testifies to other aspects of the transformation of transport in the 19th century. Much of the investment necessary for economic development in Portugal came from abroad, notably Britain. This was the case, for example, of the port trade, of railways, of mineral deposits and of the empire as a whole. Portugal also played a key role in the British Empire, as in 1870, when a telegraph station was established in Carcavelos by the Falmouth, Malta and Gibraltar Company, later Cable and Wireless, a part of a system linking Britain to India via the Mediterranean. The British staff fielded one of the cricket teams that reflected the range of British activity in the country. The station was sold in 1963. Other aspects of British influence emerged in the life and writings of Julio Diniz, 1839-1871, the pseudonym of Joaquim Guillaume Gomes Coelho, an Oporto doctor and writer who had a British mother, and before dying of tuberculosis, published Pupilias du Senor Aitor, The Pupils of the Dean, 1867, and Uma Familia Inglesa, An English Family, 1868. These popular novels focused on Anglophile middle-class life. Esed K. Roche, Realist Writer In the Chiadu in Lisbon, the statue of José María de Esa de K. Roche, erected by Antonio Teixeira López in 1903, has the famous novelist accompanied by the kind of female muse most writers can only dream about. An illegitimate child born in Pova de Verzim in 1845, he studied in Coimbra and became a journalist, moving on to become a municipal administrator in Leiria and then a consul, serving in Newcastle, Bristol and Paris. Set in Leiria, his novel O Crime do Padre Amaro, The Crime of Father Amaro, 1875, deals with clerical affairs and infanticide. Filmed in 2005, this became the then most successful Portuguese film in box office history. Another realist novel, Uj Maish, 1888, tackles the fictional Maish family as a way to consider Portugal's decline. Unwitting incest is a key element in the story. A very different picture to the cities was offered by rural and small town Portugal. These areas saw scant economic development and instead grinding poverty and a pervasive conservatism. The global economic problems of the late 19th century played through particularly harshly in Portugal. Its agriculture suffered from the competition of New World grain and meat, with goods speeded to Europe by steamship, while industry and shipping was affected by foreign rivals. Tax revenues and employment were both hit hard. Population pressures were a major issue, 
The violent disruption of the Peninsula War had led to a fall of Portugal's population to 2.9 million in 1811, but thereafter, at a time of major expansion in the world's population, there was a steady rise to 6 million by 1911. This rise was despite serious losses due to disease, particularly thanks to urban crowding and outbreaks of infectious diseases, notably cholera, as in 1833. Moreover, emigration took away part of the population growth, especially in the second half of the century, when there was large-scale movement to Brazil. As with Britain and the United States during this century, the key destination of emigrants was no longer a colony. It proved far harder to persuade people to emigrate to tropical lands. The rise in the population pressed hard on living standards. It also led to significant movements within Portugal, especially to the cities, which became more crowded. This was a background to prolonged and rising social strain and political radicalism. At the same time, by the turn of the century, about 85% of the population still lived in rural areas. The employment structure was 57% agriculture, 21.5% industry and 21.5% services. Independent Brazil Just as Britain's history was to be affected by the role and impact of the United States once independent, so Brazil remained highly significant in the Portuguese world. This was particularly so as an alternative political model within this world, a destination for emigration from Portugal, a more attractive one than Portugal's African colonies, as a crucial economic link for the latter, notably Angola, and as important to the economy of mainland Portugal. Unlike Spanish America, Portuguese America held together, which very much limited the potential options for continued Portuguese political influence there. Indeed, unlike Spain in the 1860s, Portugal was not to seek to intervene militarily in its former empire. There was a number of serious rebellions in Brazil, by the Cabanus in Pernambuco in 1832-1835 and in Pará in 1835-1836, the Sabinada in Bahia in 1837-1838, the Balaida in Maranhão in 1839-1840, and the Farapush in Rio Grande do Sul and Santa Catarina in 1835-1845. Social tension played a major role in these risings, with popular opposition to social and economic dominance by the elite, especially by large landowners. Government forces were hindered by the size of the areas of operation, poor communications and a lack of adequate training, pay and food, which led to desertion and the situation was exacerbated by the disruption caused by the conflict. The political strains led to suspicion and divisions on the government side. However, the rebellions all failed. In part, this was due to a lack of cooperation between the rebels, but other factors played a role. In the case of the Cabanus, guerrilla operations created grave difficulties for the government forces until, at the close of 1834, more active measures were put in place, especially maintaining the initiative, destroying Cabanu crops in the forest regions and hanging those thought to be Cabanus. The population suspected of sympathy for the rebels was removed and the Cabanus were isolated and increasingly short of food. Desertion was encouraged, not least through the active use of the church. Brazil also acted as a major regional power in a way that Portugal could not do. It struggled with Argentina in 1825 to 1830 in a conflict over control of Uruguay, which Brazil had annexed in 1816. In 1825, a Uruguay patriot, Juan Lavalleja, rebelled and, gaining support, defeated the Brazilians at Rincón de las Galinas and Sarandí. Because Argentina accepted his proposal for union, this became a full-scale war in which southern Brazil was invaded in 1829. The more powerful Brazilian navy blockaded Buenos Aires. Neither side was able to gain a decisive advantage. 
but the Brazilians held on to their major positions in Uruguay throughout the war. The peace settlement left Uruguay independent as a buffer state. In the War of the Triple Alliance of 1864 to 1870, Brazilian military intervention led to the Liberals gaining power in Uruguay in 1864. This was opposed by the egotistical Paraguayan president, Marshal Francisco López, an opponent of Brazilian expansion, and he invaded Brazil in 1865. Brazil bore the bulk of the alliance effort against Paraguay and provided the army of occupation after López's death in 1870. Meanwhile, under British pressure, Brazil had ended its import of slaves in 1850 to all intents and purposes. Slavery was increasingly regarded in influential circles, especially in the expanding cities, as a cause of unrest and a source of national embarrassment and relative backwardness. It was abolished in the Portuguese Empire in 1861. As part of the process by which New World settler societies were culturally dependent on the Old World, the Brazilian elite looked to Europe to validate their sense of progress. Moreover, the combination of the end of the slave trade with economic expansion meant that slavery was no longer able to supply Brazil's labour needs. A growing need for artisans, furthermore, could not be met from the traditional Brazilian slave economy. As free labour became more important, slave owners were increasingly isolated. In 1884, two provinces freed their slaves, while increased numbers of slaves fled, so that by 1887, only about 5% of the population remained as slaves. There was considerable support for slave flight, with much of the populace, as well as the bulk of the authorities, including the army, unwilling to support the owners. This contrasted with the earlier situation in the American South, whereas in the latter the stress was on regarding white society as the people, in Brazil the emphasis was on a multicultural society. The 1888 Golden Law, passed by an overwhelming majority in Parliament, freed the remaining slaves, and without compensation for the owners. This hit the sugar economy of the Northeast, and was a key aspect of a more general agrarian depression that affected the old order in Brazil, weakening the imperial monarchy. In a related but important rejection of the past, Brazil became a republic in 1889. Portugal followed 21 years later.